Kim Jones has stepped down from his role as the creative director of Fendi. Of course, if you guys aren't aware, he doesn't cover everything at Fendi. Sylvia Venturini Fendi does the menswear. She also does children's wear and accessories. And what Kim Jones was responsible for was overseeing the women's wear collections as well as the couture collections. Of course, with him stepping down from this role, it means that he will solely focus on his creative director role at Dior Arm, you know, the creative director of menswear at Dior. And that should be really interesting. He joined in 2020 when he took over from Silvio Venturini Fendi. Silvio Venturini Fendi was kind of like an interim designer in the meantime. In my opinion, I think that some of the best Fendi collections I've seen were done during that time when Silvio Venturini Fendi was the interim creative director. Of course, she actually came out in interviews and said that she has no desire to do the women's wear and do the couture long term, which is why, of course, they were looking for a replacement, even though she's a good fit. So that's when Kim Jones came in and he kind of took over from Karl Lagerfeld after that interim period from Silvio Venturini Fendi. So, of course, a lot of the speculation is down to who will take over at Fendi, which, to be very honest, is starting to become really tiring. It, this whole, you know, <laughs> musical chairs, if we're going to call it that, I just think it's become a bit excessive at this point. I just think it's. It's a bit much, you know, it's a bit much for me. Everyone's just talking about, okay, is this designer going to go to this house? And this thing I love by One Granary is really funny where it's like they have all these graphs of all these designers going to which house and who's going where and who's doing what. It's so confusing. Like Jacques Mousse is going to Chanel, but then Glenn Martins might be going to Margiela because John Galliano might be going to his own brand or Dior. And then they're saying Jonathan Addison is going to be promoted to Dior. And then Daniel Lee is interviewing for Jill Sander. <laughs> and like, oh my God, it's just a mess. And then this one too, they have Eddie Sloman might be going to Armani. Uh, Martina might be replacing Jonathan Anderson at Loewe when he goes to Dior. It's so much musical chairs. And obviously a critique that people have had is that, you know, where is the new talent? Why are we just recycling the same like 10 or 11 designers at all the brands? Like, where is the new talent? Where are the new names being mentioned? You know, it's like, oh, Claire White Keller went to Uniqlo, but then Sarah Burton's going to Givenchy. It's, <laughs> it's just too much at this point. You know, like Hyder Ackerman going to Tom Ford. Just a bit much. Just a bit much. <laughs> so much musical chairs and silver tone brass. And Luke says, I'm sick of hearing the word musical chairs. This phenomenon has existed since forever. Of course it's existed, but in this present time, it just seems specifically that there's a lot of reshuffling happening. Like, at least there are, like, 15-plus designers that have been in and out of this, like, pool and this conversation of who's going to what house? Who's going to be here? Oh, this designer went there. So it's kind of like a, a mass restructuring of the industry, uh, which tends to be interesting. I've heard around that in terms of Fendi, there are only a few choices being considered. So one of the choices is Pier Paolo Piccioli, which makes a lot of sense. Pier Paolo has already been at Fendi. There was even a time when he was working with Maria Grazia at Valentino. He kind of says that when he was at Valentino, a lot of stuff that he did was influenced by his work working at Fendi. So I don't think that there's anything wrong with Pier Paolo going to Fendi. I heard that Pier Paolo would go to other brands, which I won't mention because someone told me in confidence. So yeah, interesting choice. Do I want to see Pier Paolo at Fendi? Not really. The only person I personally want to see Pier Paolo, because the other options they've said are Sylvia Fenterini Fendi. And they've said the team. So the team is going to take over. Now me personally, I just want to see Sylvia there. I do not want to see anyone there. Sylvia had sensational collections. I know it's down to if she wants to do it, not down to any other factor, but I really, really want to see Sylvia at Fendi doing not just children's wear, men's wear, and accessories. I really want to see her do everything because I just think she's that good. And I think that she has the skills to do that. Um, and it'll be really sad 
you know, if she doesn't, she's an iconic designer for Fendi. If you think of some of the most iconic people for in terms of Fendi's history and the most iconic creations, Silvia Venturini created the baguette bag, she created the peekaboo bag, all the most iconic pieces, she has a hand in it. And she worked very closely with Karl Lagerfeld when he was still alive to even help create all these collections that people have loved over the years. So I just don't think there's any better option. But of course, it's up to her. I have my fingers crossed and I'm hoping that she changes her mind and she decides to, you know, carry the legacy. And there's also the conversation of the fact that Fendi is about to celebrate a hundred year year. And when they're celebrating 100 years, what would be better than having Silvio Venturini Fendi being at the helm again and designing the clothes, you know, with someone from the actual lineage and the family of the brand? I think that that honestly is the best option. So once again, big fan of Pio Paolo, big fan of stuff that he's done, you know, but I just want to see her there. I understand that he worked at Fendi before and he was, you know, working on the accessories and he did a lot of work on the accessories. So there's the history there, but I just want to see um, Sylvia there. Now to go back to Kim Jones, I think his time at Fendi was a very, very interesting tenure. I think that there are some moments of his Fendi that we will always remember. The biggest one that comes to my mind is the Vendace, as people were calling it at the time, which was, you know, when Fendi and Versace had this sort of collaborative effort and you had Donatella Versace design her vision of Fendi. And then you also had Kim Jones design his, his vision of Versace. And it was just a massive show. It was a big moment. Of course, that was around the time we were having discourse of so many brands working together. We saw the likes of Gucci and Balenciaga have a collaborative show. Um, and so in terms of a moment, it was great. Am I a fan of the clothes? Not really. Do I think people remember this as a moment in fashion? Yes. I even remember a big conversation around this time was also the models because they had every single big model and supermodel and you know, famous model in this show. It was kind of like, what was the fee for this show? How much did it cost having all these models on one runway? It must have been insane. Unless they did it for free as a favor because a lot of supermodels owe, you know, their supermodel status to Versace in a way because when Gianni Versace was still alive, he kind of helped to create that whole idea of supermodels and the supermodels at the show. You think of, you know, the likes of Naomi Campbell's and a lot of other supermodels. So it makes a lot of sense to have these models there, but the clothing, once again, you know, leaves a lot to be desired. And I think that was the case for a lot of Kim Jones's Fendi tenure. I think there aren't, I don't even think there is actually one collection that anyone is really going to look to or remember as, do you remember that Fendi show, May maybe outside of this Fendace show. I don't think anyone is thinking of a women's wear show or an haute couture show by Kim Jones that 10 years from now we're still going to be talking about. You know, the way we talk about some Margiela collections or the way we talk about some Raf Simmons collections. We always talk, oh, Raf Simmons at Calvin Klein. Raph Simmons. I don't think we're going to have that kind of conversation about Kim Jones. And I think that says a lot in terms of Kim Jones not being able to move the needle when he was at Fendi. So it'll be interesting to see what they do moving forward and what they do in the future. I'd also love to see Kim Jones' focus on Dior menswear because I love his Dior menswear. I do love him as a designer, especially a menswear designer. And I think that it's extremely hard to balance work at massive houses like that simultaneously. Like how exactly do you balance a brand as big as Fendi with a brand as big as Dior? It's a very hard task. and so. I'm glad that he's, you know, kind of focusing on one thing. There are very few people that have been able to do that successfully. There are the likes of, you know, J.W. Anderson that does his eponymous label and does Loewe. You had Virgil Abloh that was doing Off-White and Louis Vuitton. You had, you know, other people. Karl Lagerfeld is the most famous one doing Fendi and Chanel. That being said, maybe only Karl Lagerfeld has been able to successfully do two major houses simultaneously. 
because a lot of these designers they have their own smaller brand and then they work at a bigger brand it's not the same as you know controlling two of the biggest brands in the whole of fashion so yeah great to see him focusing on dior and look forward to seeing what he does in the future luke says also emerging talent don't have anywhere near the qualifications and experience leading slash acting as deputies at a global brand that these conglomerates are looking for i think it depends though because most times these conglomerates either hire someone who's been a creative director at so many different brands which is why you know all these names are in the hat the likes of the eddie slamans the john galliano's um the pier paolo piccioli's all these kind of designers but then on the flip side you have designers who have never worked at a big house but they have so much experience building their own business so those are people like the jacques muses of the world right so no he doesn't have experience working for you know a house under a conglomerate in that setting um but he has experience building a brand to more than a hundred million dollar brand so i think it's either or there are many designers who you know have built a successful brand in their own right whether we're talking jack moose or telfar there's there's a lot of people i can mention right and so it depends what kind of experience you're talking about and then also we can look to brands like mcqueen and who they've hired or brands like gucci hiring sabato so I think it just depends. So when I say, where's the emerging talent? It doesn't even need to be someone we know. It just should be like a good designer that has interesting designs. Maybe they've been the head of menswear behind the scenes for a major house that we just don't know yet. Ethan says, Kim Jones is genuinely one of my favorite designers of all time. Yeah, like I said, his Dior menswear to me is really amazing. I know that a lot. It's a, it gets misre- mixed reactions. Um, and there was a time that I was very critical of his menswear because it felt like he wasn't doing much designing because he would do so many collaborations. And it almost felt like maybe not that he was relying. That's maybe a bit harsh, but it just kind of felt like he wasn't standing on his two feet with his designs. He would kind of lean strongly into the collaborators and they would be responsible for the line share of the direction of a brand. So, you know, off the top of my head, we think of collaborations with Daniel Arsham, or we think of collaborations with Stussy, collaborations with artists from Ghana, you know, all these things. So it started to become a thing of like, are we going to get some Kim Jones design collections or is every season, is there going to be like a massive collaboration where we don't even know what your design language is and we don't even know really what your design style is? And I think with time, We've seen more of his design style, the long coats, the colorful gloves that I really like. Um, so it's grown on me a lot more with time. I think at the start, it almost felt like he was leaning too strongly on collaborations, in my personal opinion. Uh, Kim, for all his flaws, could certainly make a very decent bomber, especially at Louis Vuitton. Even at Dior, I think he makes really interesting bombers because he'll make them in very interesting fabrics. And they'll have like these crazy colorful linings that I really like. They're really fun. They kind of remind me of like toned down Dries Van Noten bombers. Um, so no, there's a lot, there's a lot about Kim Jones's work that I love, just not at Fendi. That's all. And that's why I didn't I never thought he was a good fit at Fendi. We've every time I have to review his shows, I say the exact same point all the time. Um, I just didn't think it was a good fit. And I've said this in a stream before, just because someone is not a good fit doesn't mean they're not a good designer. Case in point, I've said the same point with someone like Ricardo Tishi, right? Ricardo Tishi is someone I think is a really good designer. I've seen him design amazing things, especially at Givenchy. But he just wasn't a good fit for Burberry, in my opinion. But it doesn't mean all of a sudden he's now no longer a good designer. In past videos and live streams, I've talked about the fact that Haider Ackerman's Berluti wasn't for me. Of course, some people loved it. So that's neither here nor there. But me not liking his Baluti has nothing to do with what I think about Haida Ackerman as a designer because he's one of my favorite designers, right? So someone, I think sometimes people just hear, oh, he's not a good fit. And they think you're insulting a designer or saying that they're not good or they can't design. That's not the case. Sometimes things just don't fit. That's normal. Um, <laughs> Ethan says, people disagree with my takers. 
have clearly never designed anything themselves. His men's work Dior is genuinely fantastic. Damn. Ethan going for the chat. Guys. <laughs> I think it's fine to, des- to like whatever designer you like. That's completely fine. Um, my favorite designer is Andrew Milamista. I don't know too many people whose favorite designers are Andrew Milamista, to be fair. So it's completely okay. And some people tell me that Andrew Milamista's clothing is boring. All she does is design black coats, which obviously isn't true. Obviously, they haven't looked at the history of the brand or even know anything about the brand, but it's fine. That's what people would say, because that's what people see. It's it's fine. Michael says, do you think the footwear designs at Dior will take a hit since Thebo left the house and is now at Louis Vuitton? I mean, Dior footwear designs, some of them have really hit the needle, whether we're talking about the sneakers or like the clogs have been really big. Because I, I don't think that Dior is a brand that Footwear, yes, but when I think of luxury footwear, I think of Balenciaga. Dior is obviously like close by, especially with what are those um Converse shoes that they had as well, the B22s, I think they're called. Commercially, they did really well. So I don't, I don't know because I don't think the footwear is as important as it is for a brand like Balenciaga, for example. So I don't even think people will notice at Dior. Whereas, like, if Balenciaga's footwear design team just left, I think people would notice because the footwear would not be as good at all. But yeah. That was really cool, just kind of touching on the whole Kim Jones news, talking about this fashion musical chairs that is getting everyone riled up and all of that. This YouTube channel runs on your support. If you want to support the channel, you can subscribe to my Patreon. You'll gain access to exclusive content that includes everything from my Patreon podcast, where I give a behind the scenes insight into the fashion industry, as well as a fashion book club, where I review my favorite fashion books. You can also check out my fashion ebook, which highlights the best fashion journalists to follow, definitions of common fashion terminology, and how to determine what a good source of fashion information is. The links to everything are in the description below. 